Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Nasiri, and my goal is to help military veterans succeed in their civilian career. Today's episode number 298 with Brian Rutherford. Uh, who called us up and said, is your general manager at a high-end winery? He said, hey, I've got three barrels of really good cab that we're not going to barrel. Um, if I got you a sample, would you be, would you maybe be interested in buying it? And so uh, we tasted the sample. It was amazing. Uh, we talked prices, figured out we're going to have less money into that than the wine we made ourselves. Uh, and, and so we, we, we bought it. We bought three barrels, turned out to be 75 cases of wine. We pre-sold it to just our close family and friends. And then uh, turned out that that wine at that winery got 99 points from Robert Parker, one of the big, uh, one of the big wine advocates or uh, one of the scorers, right? Brian co-founded a wine business while on active duty, which is one of several side hustles in his life. Regardless of your interest in wine, entrepreneurship, or side hustle, this is a fantastic interview. We talk about how you can use an existing product while bringing marketing and branding to the table to make it a business. In Brian's case, he is redistributing wines from incredible vineyards under his own label, which means he doesn't have to work about creating and maintaining a unique product. We talk about how preparation happens well before the opportunity arises, about giving back, about using volunteering opportunities, about cultivating side pursuits while in the military, and more. As always, at beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find show notes with the text transcript of this episode, as well as links to everything we discuss, and nearly 299 other episodes just like this one. So with that, let's dive in to my conversation with Brian. Joining me today, normally in Ashburn, Virginia, but today on vacation in Destin, Florida, my guest is Brian Rutherford. Brian, welcome to Beyond the Uniform. Hey, thanks. I really, uh, really uh, am excited to be able to uh, share our story and, and chat a little bit uh, about growing a business. Awesome. Well, for listeners, uh, Brian, I, I had written in my notes, Brian is currently serving in the U.S. Army. Uh, where he's a team leader for a multifunction cyberspace operations team, and he served for 15 years. But I'm going to amend that because I just learned he is just starting on terminal leave. So that's a big transition going on that is very recent. Uh, he's also, more importantly for this conversation, the founder of Claudine Wines. Am I saying that right, Claudine? Okay. Claudine Wines, yep. Claudine right. Wines, uh, which is what we're going to spend most of our time talking about today. He started out at West Point. He served in the Army since graduating in 2004. He has an MBA from the MIT Sloan School of Management. Um, and so let's actually, since you're in it, man, let's talk about the, the transition. Uh, how did that come about, especially given that it's at that uh, awkward 15-year point, and, and how is it going so far? Yeah, hey, it's a question I get uh, most often. Um, why would you leave at 15 years? Well, first of all, I'm staying in the reserves, and I'm I'm looking forward to that chapter. But I think uh, you know we all leave at some point, and uh, you know I I leave having done uh, everything I've ever wanted to do and more in in the army. So whether it started out in the infantry, uh, then got to teach at West Point for a couple of years, and then uh, switch over to cyber and lead a, a cyber team. Um, it really is, uh, it's not about, uh, hey, the Army's not doing something for me or whatnot. It really is about just solving different problems and looking for that next challenge. And, you know, it, it, if it's all about the, the money and the retirement, well, you know, I think I think I've got a few things going to, so, so that's not going to be a, a huge issue. Um, and like I said, still staying in the reserve. So, so far, so good. Um, I guess we'll we'll find out when I actually don't have my uh, ID card anymore. So uh, still got a couple months of terminal leave. That's awesome. Well, let's start with um, let's start. I, I want to zoom back. I want to go rewind to the start of Clouding Wines, but let me just start today. If you bumped into someone randomly on the street who's serving in the military and they said, "Brian, what what is it that you're doing now that you're out of the army?" How would you answer that question? Yeah, so it's it's all about doing multiple things, and hopefully we get to talk about that a little bit. Is you know I think as you think about fi financial freedom and really what you want to do in life from a professional standpoint, having multiple income streams is the way to go. I talk to plenty of people who do real estate uh, on the side, or maybe they just rent out their homes that they bought along the way as they move from uh, post and and, and base uh, to base. And and for me, this is just a, this was my way of finding a little side hustle and then and then moving along. So. Uh, the short story about uh, what we do is we go to high-end wineries in Napa Valley, uh, generally speaking, uh, and uh, 
buy their orphan barrels, three to five barrels at a time, uh, that for a lot of reasons, they're not gonna bottle themselves. Uh, we make a deal on the spot and then we bottle it under our own label. And that's where, uh, that, that's what we do. So in, uh, you know, when we buy the wine, we can't say where we get it from. So we get really, really good prices. Uh, so for example, our Cabernet is, uh, would sell for normally about $150 a bottle if, uh, if it has that winery's label on it. For us, we sell it for 50 or, or less. Uh, and we're able to do that because we don't say where we get it from. Uh, and so um, again, you're drinking really good wine for, for not a lot of money. That, that's awesome. So there's plenty here to dig into, but let me just yeah. ask one question so I understand. I'm guessing that, you know, let's say this winery sells their wine for a hundred bucks. At that price point, they have a lot more supply of grapes and wine than they can actually sell. So they're just kind of like, hey, we can't actually sell this at that price point, but we don't want to diminish our brand. We don't want to lose out on that. But if you can, if we can make you know, 50 bucks from you and you can sell it or, or whatever they end up paying, is that about right of how that relationship works? That's exactly right. You know, we realized that a couple of years ago that there was no, nobody doing this in the small lots. There's plenty of big wineries that are buying a lot of bulk wine. And that's the, the part of the market that we're in is bulk wine. Um, that we're doing uh, low cost, uh, high volume stuff. But we said, hey, I bet there's really good wine at these high end wineries too. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that turns out to be true. Um, but you're right there. They worry about brand image a whole lot. Uh, there are flash sale sites. We've probably all seen them. Uh, they do it in, in the wine business as well. They, you know, it, it hurts their brand when uh, you have a full price, full paying customer, uh, maybe somebody on your email list who buys full price one day and then three weeks later, they see the same wine that they just paid full price for on a flash sale site for 60% off. Oh, totally. And then they call it the winery. Oh yeah. And cancel their membership. Or I, or I, I uh, say I'm never going to buy again until I find a good deal and then I forget to do it. And I, it's just, I can imagine there's a lot there. So, so Take us back to the origin. Where did this come from? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I first visited Napa Valley in 2008. And uh, for those of, of you who have been, it's, uh, it seems, it's like surreal, right? It's really pretty. It's Northern California. There's some very opulent uh, buildings. The wineries are, are amazing. Um, and so uh, probably bit by the bug back then, um, just coming off of a, a deployment and getting ready for another one, um, said, wow, it'd be awesome to, to be a part of this somehow. And so uh, fast forward a few years, my brother, uh, who's my business partner, uh, lives in the San Francisco area. Uh, and uh, we just had, we kind of fell into it. Uh, we actually made wine one year, we, we bought grapes, we bought a, a half a ton of grapes. Uh, we, we went to a custom crush place who, who did the wine making for us. And then uh, a year later, after it spent some time in the barrel, uh, we had our first wine. And it was like not that good, right? We had basically about $25 per bottle into it and, uh, and it wasn't that great. And so we thought, oh, that was fun once. We'll never do that again. We're not really winemakers. Um, and so we kind of put that on the shelf. Uh, the next year we just, we had a, a general manager who become a family friend. So hopefully we can talk a little bit about networking, how important that is, uh, who called us up and said, she had a general manager at a high-end winery said, hey, I've got three barrels of really good cab that we're not gonna barrel. Um, if I got you a sample, would you be, would you maybe be interested in buying it? And so uh, we tasted the sample. It was amazing. Uh, we talked prices, figured out we're going to have less money into that than the wine we made ourselves. Uh, and, and so we, we, we bought it. We bought three barrels, turned out to be 75 cases of wine. We pre-sold it to just our close family and friends. And then uh, turned out that that wine at that winery got 99 points from Robert Parker, one of the big, uh, one of the big wine advocates or uh, one of the scorers, right? Uh, wine critics. So it, it, we, we found out, wow, you can actually buy really high-end wine if you, if you know the right person and they're ready to, to pull the trigger, I suppose, when the, when the opportunity is there. Uh, and so um, a few more of our friends heard about this, said, hey, next time you do that, I'm in for a case, three cases, whatever. Uh, and so the following year, so this is the third year that we put Claudine on a bottle, um, we were offered nine barrels and, uh, and we said, we probably need to get a little bit more legitimate and, uh, and build this uh, the, the right way. So um, built the website, got uh, the proper licensing uh, and then, um, then hit go. And that was three years ago, sold that first bottle in uh, September of 2016. I don't know where the time goes, but somehow we went from a very small email list, really uh, family and close friends, uh, and, and and here we are with about 1,300 people on an email list, uh, and I'm sending wine all over the country. You know, 
I'll tell you, the, the day you know and you make it is when you don't know who's buying your stuff, mm-hmm. right? I remember seeing all the, the orders come in. We use Shopify as a platform, great place to, to get up and going. And I'd see a name come through and like, oh, I know that person. Or, uh, you know, then at some point, like, I don't know who that is. I don't know where I'm shipping that wine. I wonder how they heard about us. And then, uh, you know, you, we, we grew like that. So, so that's the, uh, I guess maybe not so short story. No, but, uh, this is great. And so a couple things that come up for me, first of all, just to make sure I'm, I'm tracking right. I'm guessing that if you're, if you're kind of taking a wine, repackaging it, selling it, that's essentially saying the risk is less on you or that, that your energy is less spent on product. It's much more spent around marketing, sales, distribution, maybe some like branding and stuff like that, but you're not having to spend all of your time developing a wine or like building, you know, I don't know what the right word is for it. Is yeah. that, is that fair? You're exactly right. We go to the very end of the process. And then I, I say we de-risk the whole thing, right? Um, we go to the end. Luckily for us, there's plenty of really good wine out there. Uh, I will say this though, that we, for every 10 things we taste, uh, we, we probably don't produce nine of them. Uh, mm-hmm. They either are not the right price or just not uh, the right profile for us. And so um, we, again, think about how, how things have changed for us. We now get phone calls from wineries saying, hey, would you be interested in? Wow. It used to be us going to them saying, hey, do you have a few extra barrels? Um, because again, all that brand image stuff that we talked about uh, is, is absolutely true and something they care about. But you're right, we go to the end of the process, we taste, we only buy the barrels that, uh, uh, that meet kind of our standards. Uh, and we like literally mark a barrel in a in a cellar, uh, and and then have our uh, one of our delivery partners come and pick up those barrels and take it to the bottler. Wow! And um, and I may have missed this, but where did your love? Because that that's like that's a deep understanding of wine, right? Like you're not a are you a sommelier or like where, where did this start? And like, how did you gain the confidence to say like, hey, I like this, and therefore other people will like it, versus like. I don't know. Like for me, I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. exactly. Um, that's a great question. I mean, my parents were drinking, I think they went to Napa Valley the first time in the mid nineties. Mm. Uh, a friend took them there and said, Hey, we got to try out this place. Um, so they went. And so I would say as I grew up, there was kind of good wine around the house. Uh, and so, uh, of course I didn't drink till I was <clears throat> 21, but <laughs> if let's say that I did a little bit before, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was kind of grew up on, uh, on good wine. And mm. so, uh, it's just like good coffee or good beer or anything else that is like once you've had good quality, it's very hard to step, you know, step, take a step backwards. Yep. Um, so we grew the business because I wanted to drink good wine, but my budget couldn't afford the good wine. Right. So that's amazing. Uh, <laughs> so here well, we are. What I what I love in this example, though, for listeners is I, I often hear from veterans and non-veterans alike. I want to start a business and I don't have an idea or. I don't know what, you know, the product is and you're exemplifying a form of entrepreneurship where you don't have to cr- necessarily create something entirely from scratch. And I imagine there's parallels in, in pretty much every product where you can take some sort of more generic product and make it your own and then focus on a limited skill set. And I'm, I'm, I'm admiring that because for you to produce and really develop that, that's, that's, 50 different skill sets and you've kind of maybe narrowed it down to 20 skill sets that you need to be successful, which is, is certainly easier than, or more focused than trying to do everything. So you're exactly right. I mean, if I am anything, I am a branding and marketing person. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, yes, we have to have good product and we need to be uh, specific when we choose the wine uh, that we produce. Um, however, uh, really, it is about the story that I tell about it. And and that is what's interesting to the right demographic. You know, if you've never spent more than $15 on a bottle of wine, when you hear that ours is 50, you're like, that's still really expensive. Uh, and I totally understand that. Um, so we realized that when we do our you know, marketing, we focus that on people who've already maybe spent $100. And I tell them they can get that same experience for, uh, for 50% off uh, or even more in some cases. Um, so we've learned that over time about who's our best customer and how do we find our best customer? Um, because, uh, you know, not everybody, uh, you have to have the right product and market fit. And, and that's what we've learned over time, what ours is. And I, and I think what's powerful for listeners is, is whether it's sales or entrepreneurship or wh- whatever aspect of business you go into, you're illustrating that as a company, 
you are not selling to everyone. You are getting smarter and smarter about the tiny subset of customers that are your customers and that's where you go after. And I do see you know, my own path, I've done this as a mistake and I see a lot of people do this where you want everyone to love your product or whatever you're doing, when in truth, you really just need to find the, the, the small, relatively small subset who loves that and who sees that as like, hey, this is a great deal, it's not a hundred bucks. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about is when you started that, um, you, you said you had that first batch of, I forget, it was like, let's say nine cases. How did you have the money to do that initial purchase? And was that, was that a big leap of faith or is that kind of something where it was like, eh, I'm throwing a roulette ball and if it wins, great. If not, not a big deal. Yeah, it's a great question. So when we did the first three barrels, so 75 cases, we pre-sold all of it. We, again, in our kind of friend and family group, we, we sent an email out to about 20 people who we knew liked wine and said, hey, we have the opportunity to buy this really good stuff. Uh, but I need your money up front uh, and I need you to, to take a little leap of faith. Um, but again, when you're at $25 a bottle and we, we told them everything we could about, uh, we didn't even have a non-disclosure at that point. So we told them exactly what winery came from. We said, here's their, even, here's their website and here's the, what they're going to sell us the same wine for, uh, for like 80% off. So it wasn't hard to sell that very first one. Uh, of course, we didn't make any money on that. We literally sold at our cost. So it was the following year um, that we did. We had to take a, uh, yeah, I say we, and I, I talk about my brother. He, I have been the one who probably runs the business, uh, most of the business. I'll say, you know, maybe 80 or 90% of the work, but he financed us to begin with. And so uh, that is where um, I think business partnerships are awesome for a lot of different reasons uh, because, you know, a yin and a yang. Uh, I don't have all the best ideas, so we are able to bounce things off each other all the time. But also, he brought something that I didn't have at that time, which was uh, some cash. Um, but that was a one-time uh, one time investment, and we have not had to put any more money uh, into the business uh, since then. So. And and is your, you mentioned earlier, a partner in Napa. Is that your, your brother, or is there someone else? Yeah, nope, that's my brother. Uh, okay. So we are, he's just a year older than me, and uh, he's actually a doctor uh, in San Francisco. Um, but... Uh, yeah, it was really kind of his part of partly his network of uh, friends. And then I also have a younger brother that is in the wine business in Napa, but not part of our business necessarily. Mm -hmm. But we absolutely lean on him for connections and that sort of thing. So, you got a man on the inside. That's right. It's, it's important. <laughs> I didn't know everything about this uh, business, but uh, um, I've, I've learned over time. And then, you know, when we saw the opportunity, we were ready to jump. And that's the that's a great learning point is you know, the preparation happens well before the opportunity uh, arises. Uh, I probably was bit by the entrepreneurship bug, maybe at business school, maybe years ago, who knows. Um, but when we saw this little niche of a market that was underserved, this bulk uh, wine, high-end wineries, um, that, man, this, this can work. And then we, we just did it. And you figure things out uh, as you go along. Mm, that's, that's great. I was... Uh... Yeah, I think that's a great quote. You, preparation happens well before the opportunity, and I think you're mm -hmm. you're right. Like you want, you don't know when that serendipity will will arise, and you want to be ready. And I, I like that thought of of constant vigilance. How has working with your brother in a professional context? How has that changed the relationship? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. I you know at business school they tell you don't don't do two things when you start a business. Mm -hmm. um, don't go into business with family, mm -hmm. and don't do 50-50 partnerships because uh, it'll just end terribly. Um, I am happy to say three plus years that we are closer now. I mean we've always been close, um, but we can have very frank discussions. Uh, you know about hey we want to go in this direction or we want to do that, and uh, and we can disagree. But we get off the phone like well couldn't have that conversation with literally anybody else. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, it's a, it's a foundation of trust. Um, yeah. Do we have our, our challenges? We, we absolutely do. Um, but, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we're, we are totally in sync on producing good wine, you know, bringing good wine, uh, to our customers, uh, and creating value that way. That's awesome. And then at what point, uh, actually let's talk about, so you're doing this, you're on active duty and your brother is working full time as a doctor especially for those listeners who are on active duty, could you talk about any advice for having a side hustle while fully employed? Yeah, that's a, I don't know. I honestly don't know. And I've got a, a family, two kids, seven and nine years old. So um, 
balancing it all, I was, I was just telling my brother the other day, I don't, re- I don't know what it's like to come home from work and not do something else. Um, mm-hmm. So um, there's, there's a lot of nights and weekends uh, there. Um, but also I learned the importance of outsourcing. And, and I'll give a plug to a website called Upwork. Um, it used to be uh, Elance uh, for, for freelancers. Um, but I have learned to outsource things that are uh, that have a protocol that I can, hey, you do X, then Y, then Z. I outsource that. I mean, I outsource accounting. I taught accounting at West Point. I went to business school for accounting. I can do that, but I realize that's not my best. If I have one or two hours to do something, it's not accounting. Uh, that's what not what I should be doing. That doesn't create value for my business. So, um, But you have to be careful what you outsource. We tried to outsource some marketing uh, at one point. And uh, we got some really great graphic design out of it. And I uh, can't say enough about that. Again, that's not my skill set. But I realized that the voice, the voice of our emails and our tone on, the, on our webpage, that has to come from us. I mean, the name Claudine, that's my grandmother, uh, passed away many years ago. But, um, you know, our whole brand is built around this, uh, you know, value. Uh, you know, you can have nice things, but you don't have to pay a lot for it because that's who Claudine was. Um, I realized that nobody tells that story the way that I tell that story, the way that my brother tells that story. I can't outsource the marketing. I can't outsource, you know, copywriting. Um, you know, so be careful. Definitely outsource, but be careful what you outsource, and uh, you can't outsource it all. Hmm. And, and for listeners, so I, I, I love Upwork. I've used them for almost a decade now. They're they're mm-hmm. exceptional. Um, I want to call out, and I'll put this in the show notes, in episode 297, the episode right before this one, I interviewed Laura Renner, who runs Freedom Makers. And um, I wouldn't consider them necessarily broad spectrum outsourcing in the sense of like, if you need an accountant and you need a design company and someone to build your website, I'm not sure if that's in their wheelhouse, but they, we had a really good discussion around virtual assistance and delegation. And I think that what Brian's talking about here applies, whether you're an entrepreneur or an executive, your ability to get things off your plate. And I love the distinction Laura used, which is it's not necessarily just about time. It's about energy. Any task that you do that's depleting and really makes you more lethargic trying to get that off your plate. So you're energized to do the things that really matter. And I I love, Brian, how you're saying like, hey, the voice, the emails, that has to be us. And I think there's a fair amount of discernment there of saying like, what am I uniquely needing to do versus what can I get off my plate? So true. Uh, it's so true. Don't, don't do the things that, uh, that are, you know, the mundane or just, just take up time, do the things that create the value or that somebody else cannot do. And, mm. uh, we learned that a hard way kind of over time, uh, that I was, uh, at a breaking point probably a couple of years ago. And I said, I've got to, I've got to remove some things from my plate. And, um, you know, you, you when there, when things are small, when you first get off the ground, you're involved in every part of the business and you should be. So you understand how, how it works. Um, but once you get into a routine and the, you know, you get the same thing, here's what happens when an order comes in, it gets, you know, put on this sheet and, and submitted in. Uh, and then there's a follow up to make sure the shipment happened. That can all be done by, uh, you know, that can either be automated or, uh, or be done by someone else. And mm. um, a- absolutely, that's not my best uh, time spent. Mm. What about, well, quick question is, um, we'll hopefully have time to get into the other side hustles, but let's just say if you had a pie chart of your time or the money that you make, what, what, what slice of the pie is going to Claudine right now? Yeah, I would say of my not nine to five uh, army job. And again, you know, I, like you mentioned, I just drove away from that on, uh, on Friday. I would say um, 30% of my time. So, so in terms of hours per week, on average, probably uh, 10 to 12 hours per week on Claudine. Mm. Um, and that's grown over time. Uh, that uh, it didn't start off that way. Uh, There's probably a big, you know, at the beginning there was when we were in licensing and all that stuff, but then it kind of, um, kind of went into a lull, but now as we've ramped up more customers and mm. fulfilling orders, it, uh, um, yeah, probably 10 or 12 hours a week. And how, um, how long from like that first decision to do this until it was like somewhat self-sustaining or you felt like it reached some sort of tipping point? Was it like yeah. a year or two years? Right. Uh, yeah, no, I think about a year, right? So we, uh, when we first launched, um, we had a lot of good sales, but you know, I think that was people that were just supporting my brother and I, and mm-hmm. you know, who would buy whatever product that we were selling one time. Um, and so I was, uh, I was a little cautious at that time, not to read too far into our first month sales. 
um, you know, it's in September. So it was starting to cool off. That matters too. And it's hard to sell red wine in the summer, to be really honest. Uh, so, so I, I didn't uh, read too far into it, but then, you know, a year later when those people were coming back for a second or third or fourth order, uh, then I realized, okay, you, you know, people are coming back for the product. They'll buy one time because they support you. They come back again because they see value in it. Uh, and they tell their friends about it because they see value in it and want to share that. So mm. probably a year. Probably okay. took a year. And then you mentioned earlier networking, because it sounds like that played a really big role in your finding this, this first big opportunity and realizing you didn't have to produce your own wine or, or make your own wine. Uh, what, what thoughts do you have around networking or, or any advice in that? Well, I, I'm a person who will take a phone call or a, a video conference or something with literally anybody. I love talking to people. I think everybody's got an interesting story to tell. So, uh, but that you can end up on a lot of phone calls that don't pertain to what you're doing and, and you can run yourself thin. So um, specific to this, uh, you know, we had to, I needed to learn a little bit about the wine industry. Um, so I would, uh, when I go out to Napa Valley and I've probably been out there now, 25 times in the last 10 years, maybe, maybe more. Um, you know, I, it, it used to be about going and tasting, going to wineries and doing the kind of Napa Valley thing, but now it's more business. It's about tasting wine with a thought about uh, how do I market and brand this pricing, all of those sorts of things. Um, but I ask all kinds of questions. And then I ask, I always ask of, you know, something of people, Hey, can you introduce me to somebody? Who do you think I should talk to next? Uh, but then offer that as well. Um, hey, is there anything I can do to help you out? Um, you know, maybe it's uh, maybe, you know, who knows? You just never know who you're going to partner with. I never burn a bridge. Um, I just feel like the world is a small place. And um, I love uh, I love asking because, you know, for things uh, from people. And if they say, hey, I'll, 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 you know, do an introduction, then I will follow up on that. Uh, but I also return that. Uh, and I, I make connections all the time uh, for other people. And and you and I have a shared connection, I found out right at the start of the show with Preston Pish, which for listeners, I'll add this in the show notes, uh, Preston's incredible. He's episode 290. He runs We Study Billionaires and has uh, also been very, that's actually interesting, you both were very, very active while on active duty, which is, is exciting to see. But what, what was the story there? Like, how did he end up affecting your business? So uh, it's a great story. We were at uh, um, we were at some training together. We were at a summer uh, course, uh, the intermediate level education, right? So we're at Fort Belvoir in Virginia uh, for 16 weeks together, and we find out that we're both interested in investing and, and whatnot. So we immediately uh, click over that, and he said, "Hey, I, I don't have anybody on my podcast this uh, th this week." And this is now he's done several hundred podcasts and. He gets some really big names. He's at about seventy to eighty thousand downloads a day of his uh, of his podcast. So, uh, but not in the early days, that was four years ago now, five years ago almost. Um, he uh, he invited little old me uh, on there, and we talked uh, markets and investing um, a little bit. And I had just graduated business school at that time. And then at the end, he said, "Hey, why don't you uh, why don't you tell people about your uh, your wine business?" And oh, by the way, we were like in his hotel room drinking a bottle of wine during this podcast. So uh, he's like, this stuff is amazing. You've got to tell my listeners about this. Well, we went from uh, about 300 people on our email list to about 1300 on our email list in about a month. And we did, um, we doubled our lifetime sales in that very first month uh, after going on the podcast. As I realized it was, uh, it was a perfect demographic. It's people that were interested in investing in markets and whatnot probably also the same people that if you say, Hey, I can sell you a $150 bottle of wine for 50 bucks that they're like, yes, I think I'll do that. So, uh, or at least I'll give it a try. And those are some of my best customers. Uh, and I've since been on his podcast a couple of times and, uh, uh, we always have a great conversation and then he always lets me uh, talk a little bit about uh, the wine business afterwards. I, I think that is nice because it goes back to your quote at the beginning, preparation happens well before the opportunity arises. And it doesn't sound like you were going on there expecting for this to be such a pivotal moment in your business. And I can imagine if you weren't prepared, if you didn't have your elevator pitch, if you didn't have everything kind of buttoned up, your website wasn't ready that opportunity would have been missed, but you had the website up. You knew how to talk about it. You knew how to sell it in a way that was authentic for you. You knew how to tell the story or whatever made the difference. You know, who knows, like, who knows what would have happened had you not been ready. And you certainly weren't expecting that. And I think that underscores this whole thought around preparation. 
I think you're you're exactly right. Um, I was not expecting for him to talk about the wine business at all, um, but we had also uh, just bottled to several different projects, so we had plenty of inventory. You know, the worst thing that can happen is you get a big bump. You know, you go on Oprah's load as a ten favorite things, and then your website crashes because you weren't ready for it. Uh, or in our case, if all those people would have showed up to our website and there would have been nothing to buy because we had run out of everything. So um, I remember in the months leading up to that, that we had kind of, we had gotten down about zero in the, in the bank um, by just buying inventory because mm -hmm. um, we found the right projects and we just, you know, we wanted to, to be able to produce it. Um, and then luckily, you know, we get this big bump in sales and, um, you know, my, some of my best customers through that. So mm -hmm. you're right. It was uh, fortuitous. Um, I won't, give myself really any credit uh, for that, but uh, just um, it was a, a luck, lucky stroke there, I suppose. And you had mentioned, I know that Claudine is, is kind of one of multiple side hustles. Um, what, are the, what are the other things that you spend your time on? Yeah, so so for now, this is the one uh, money, you know, producing one. And, uh, and it goes back to, um, you know, at some point, you got to pay yourself. Um, and so the first year it didn't, everything went back into the business, uh, year, year then two and three, I spent a lot of time on this. And so, uh, I talked to my brother about it and I said, Hey, I think, we, I think I'd like to take up some sort of a management fee, you know, so he doesn't do a lot of the day to day work. Um, I do. And so, uh, so we agreed on a number and then we've been able to kind of increase that. So, you know, it's, uh, you got to, there's got to be some payoff, I believe uh, for you. Um, so, uh, so this is the one, uh, one thing I do, I get involved in the community a lot. And this is a, a big thing that is important to me. So I, I was on the board uh, of my homeowner association, which sounds mm -hmm. kind of crazy, but it allowed me to just be in our community. Um, as I was leaving the uh, Fort Gordon, uh, Georgia area, um, I, I realized that a lot of my goodbyes were not just people in uniform. They were um, local business leaders. They were uh, people in the Chamber of Commerce. They were just movers and shakers in the community uh, because those who, who I built relationships with over time. So um, I absolutely 100% believe in uh, investing in your community. Uh, and that had nothing to do with my business. I didn't sell wine to those people. Uh, it just it, it is something that's important that um, I've been lucky that I got to go to business school and I got to, you know, some great training in the army. I can give some of that back. Uh, and so, um, so that's been, that would be my other uh, side hustle is, is being involved in the community. And now as I move, I'll probably do that again, um, get involved in the community. But um, yeah, I, lo I love that because uh, both with networking as well as the community, it's, it's clear there's a very strong desire to give back, to, to be generous. And I think that that's a approach that will resonate with a lot of listeners because it's not now like, oh, I'm going to this event to see what I can get out of people. It's kind of going with an intent of, of giving to others. And my just personal thesis is the more that you do that genuinely, there's some, some number of gifts that kind of rebound and it kind of works out. But when it's, it's, it feels to me different than when I go into something like, what am I going to get out of this? That usually falls flat. And, in, and it might be over the course of years or a decade, you know, it's not like this immediate expectation, but I love this thought, like you're accepting phone calls from anyone over time that, that, that pays off, but it's not like you're looking for that payout as far as why you're doing it. No, I mean, people have helped me out along the way. You, you know, we talked about Preston being uh, instrumental, um, but he talks to me about the business side of, of what we do too. So not just, uh, you know, plugging me on a, on a podcast that gets a lot of reach, but but it's, uh, it really is, uh, you know, he and I talked even this last weekend about um, virtual assistants and, uh, and getting the right one and why that that's important. Mm -hmm. So um, it is, but it, it goes both ways. I also give out a lot of wine. So uh, um, it's my, I tell people it's my currency in life. So if I have a great conversation, I really get something valuable uh, uh, or, or not, or I just think that you'd like some wine, I will uh, drop a couple bottles in the mail um, because uh, because why not? I mean, it it really is about giving and about uh, experiencing um, experiencing new things. So. And and so back to your decision to leave the army. How did you approach that? The fifteen year mark. Like, what was the thought process going in? Because a lot of people would stay stay on for those last five years. Like, was there a point at which you said, "Hey, Claudine can support me and my family"? Or um, how, how did you approach that from a financial aspect? Yeah, so I think one thing we didn't talk about is, is so I am continuing Claudine and actually bringing on, uh, hopefully bringing on another business partner, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. 
but I'm also going to another job. Um, I have uh, an interview and I'm going to do uh, management consulting mm-hmm. uh, for at least for a little while uh, as I leave the army. Um, so that protects a little bit of my downside for sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, in this whole process of leaving, I've talked to so many people that are, you know, we talk about the wine business. They're like, you're crazy to go into consulting. Why don't you just do this? If, you, if it's about raising some money so you can actually make that next big step, let me introduce you to, you know, X, Y, and Z person, and you can raise that money. Um, and I'm pretty sure that I, that I can, I guess there's a little bit of risk aversion in me still, uh, that says, you know what, I can do some consulting and then I'll have that on my resume. And then, you know, if Claudine continues to go 18, 24 months, maybe I, I pop out and I do that. Um, so, so I am going to another, uh, kind of salary job. Um, but Claudine absolutely is still gonna, uh, gonna, gonna run. Um, you know, w- deciding when to leave. Um, I, I guess I had this moment of, you know, I'm 36 years old. I, I'm lucky that I'm in, in great health. I, my family's all in good health. Um, it was just about, I, I just wanted to solve different problems, do different things. And um, I think there are opportunities, uh, things that are available to you in your 30s that may not be available to you in your 40s um, when you already have one retirement. Um, I heard some feedback about, yeah, we love hiring military, but you know, when you've already got one pension, that might actually affect how much you, uh, um, how much you're going to be willing to give to somebody else. So um, it was just the right time. Uh, everything kind of lined up. And, yeah. and you're going to McKinsey. I am. Yeah. yeah. So very, very excited. I'm, again, I'm super, yeah. I, I have uh, some of my best friends from business school and even from the army are at McKinsey and mm-hmm. um, it's a great firm. Uh, I'm super excited to get going. Uh, and uh, you know, there's going to be great training there, solving some really challenging, fun and challenging problems. So, um, and how did you, uh, or how have you approached finding uh, someone to shepherd and and run your baby while you kind of pass the football to them? Yeah, so I was on another podcast, actually for a vet's podcast, but uh, for kind of uh, you know focused in on the service academies, and through that I, I again networking. Um, I had somebody call me up and say, hey, I print labels out of Portland and I'd love to, you know, maybe, you know, work with you. Um, we sent our business there. We got a quote and it was like 40% less than what I was paying in Napa to get printing done. So there's another vet owned, you know, uh, you know, guy that I met and, uh, and saved us money. Um, but one of the other things that happened out of there was uh, somebody called me and said, hey, I I'd like to uh, maybe do a private label. Would you, is there, is it possible for you to, instead of putting Claudine on the label, can, can, can we put in something else on it? And absolutely. We actually do that for uh, a couple of other people. And so uh, we were looking for different uh, wines, something that would fit what he was looking for. Uh, And then I, you know, as we kept this conversation going, I said, yeah, I'm at this kind of fork in the road. I don't know what, you know, what, what Claudine's going to look like in the future. And he said, you know what? I mean, I'm an empty nester. Uh, I've been I've been in branding and marketing for my entire career, um, post post army for for him, and uh, he's like maybe you know maybe we could uh, partner up and, and work together. And so he's traveling out to Napa Valley here uh, shortly with me. He's going to get a crash course in Claudine 101, and we'll see where it goes. Um, so back to that networking thing, super important. Back to taking that phone call uh, and spending that time. Um, I could potentially have a new business partner uh, to help run day to day out of it all. That's great. And and what I love about all of this is there there seems to be this prevailing thought that one should focus on their passion or, you know, if you're getting traction, you got to go all in. And I love that you're showing an example of something that energizes you, something that generates money. But it's not like you're looking to this to be your be all end all right now. Like you're letting it be what it is. And I've seen so many people try to force an organization or a job to be something it's not. And I could see a a scenario where you really want Claudine to support you and your family full time. And maybe that puts too much of a cash strain on it. And maybe what would have become an empire just dwindles away because it doesn't have the money to grow. And so I love that you're just kind of, I picture you uh, blowing on a flame and like getting it to grow rather than just smothering it. Well, I love teams of people too. You know, like I said, I do a lot of the day-to-day stuff and I, I mean, I've been looking for somebody who's got a branding and marketing background because I said, that's a lot of what we do, you know, and then 
it's fortuitous that at this moment when I'm, you know, need to offload some of the day to day that somebody shows up and says, Hey, I've been doing that thing. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see if it, uh, if it'll work out. I, I have really good hopes uh, for it, but, um, you're right. I am not a person who needs to control 100% of the company, and uh, I, I don't want to ever give up any equity or anything like that. No, I, I want to be a part of something that grows, and I think that uh, is best done in teams. Um, mm-hmm. You know, maybe that's the army in me that uh, it is. You know, we, we we do everything in teams. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that is uh, is by yourself uh, mm-hmm. in the military. So, um, you know. You got to have the right business partners uh, in, in life and in business, um, you know, so you should think long and hard about that, uh, mm-hmm. that decision. Uh, but I, I think teams are, are much stronger than individuals. That's great. And, and I always like to ask about resources. You know, you've learned a lot, obviously, about marketing, about branding. Is, is there any book or podcast or conference or online course, anything that's helped you in your starting companies and having these side hustles that you would recommend to listeners? Yeah, definitely. Um, so how I built this is a great podcast, a NPR podcast about um, business, how businesses have gotten started and, and, and off the ground. It's a, it was a great uh, snippets there. Um, books, uh, Jim Collins, good to great is a, is a really good one. Um, influence Robert Cialdini realized that there is like what we do in marketing, what we're always influencing people, whether I'm, and the army trying to get uh, my boss to, you know, see, you know, let us do something or you're always influencing. And so understanding the science behind influence, I think, is really uh, super important. So Cialdini uh, is, is kind of a leader in that area. Uh, and then uh, recently, uh, somebody turned me on to this book called Building a Story Brand. That's by Donald Miller. And this is really about telling your story. How do you um, how do you distill down what it is that you do? And then how do you communicate that to, to other people? And uh, just super fascinating um, to understand what it is that, uh, that you do. I realized after, after reading that or listening to it, I do all these on audiobooks uh, while I'm working out or something else, driving, whatnot, um, you know, that uh, we're in the trust business. Like we cannot produce a bad project um, because we don't have a tasting room where we have lots of, you know, foot traffic or anything like that. Our customers, that relationship, they've got to see value in, in what we're doing, uh, and we've got to kind of hit the mark all the time. So um, everything we do is kind of about building trust. That's great. And, and for our listeners at beyondtheuniform.org, I'll add links to Good to Great, Influence, Building a Story Brand, all, all of those resources. Um, I want to ask your advice on two things. One is, um, in, this is very specific, but if someone is listening and excited about the wine industry and wants to go in that direction after service or right now, what advice you have for them? And then what advice you have for someone who either wants to start a company or or at least start some sort of side hustle that may generate some money? Yeah. So uh, a couple of thoughts on that, how to get into the wine business. First of all, like you wouldn't ever choose to go into the wine business. It's highly regulated. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, you have 50 states, 50 different shipping laws and and whatnot, uh, which we are constantly navigating. However, it's something we are passionate about. And when you're passionate about something and you find the right business model, you will break through those barriers mm-hmm. and you'll figure it out. Um, so, you know, what I would tell people is, is where I thought I was going to start is, is I thought I'd just volunteer some time doing some sommelier work or, um, you know, helping a, uh, there was a catering business who, who, you know, would just kind of pick some random bottles that they didn't know a lot about wine. And so what I thought I would do is just uh, consult with them and, uh, and help uh, pick wine for events. Um, and I started to do that and then this kind of fell in my lap. So, um, find a, a place, if you're passionate about being in this business, um, uh, find a place where you can learn about it. Uh, and that could be calling me, send me an email and, uh, we'll set up a phone call. Uh, and I'll talk about there's, there's, there's been plenty of other ways to get involved, um, that I think would be uh, useful. Um, so the second, the second part is about starting a side hustle. So a quick anecdote, um, I get off the plane here in, in Destin and, uh, um, call an Uber and uh, a guy shows up. Somehow I matched with a Tesla, which is pretty cool. Didn't pay extra for that. Um, but uh, a guy shows up to pick up our family and, uh, you know, gets to talk to the Uber driver. And he's uh, an active duty Air Force here. And he actually runs a fleet of Teslas uh, here uh, it, using an app called Turo, where you can rent cars out. So he does two things. He uh, rents cars out on Turo uh, and he does a little bit of driving for Uber and Lyft. Uh, and, uh, I said, how did you, you know, decide to do that? I mean, he's an enlisted guy, you know, as I, you know, are you independently wealthy? You just buy this uh, fleet of Teslas. 
He said, no, you know, I went to the local Tesla dealer uh, and uh, got a really good deal. Uh, they threw in free supercharging. Uh, and he said, I only need to rent that thing out for about six days a month to break even. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's like, it's, it's booked up almost all the time. I was like, that is awesome. I love that you just, you know, he was passionate about cars and he wanted to, it didn't take anything. He really, he started with one, uh, and, uh, and now he's got a, a small fleet of them. Um, and so that is, that is it. He was prepared. He was excited about something. And then when he saw an opportunity, he jumped into it. Uh, so that's what I tell people is, uh, you know, he, he made sure he had the right product market fit that he realized there weren't a lot of Teslas down here, especially on Turo and, and, uh, and for Uber and Lyft. Uh, so he found out that there was a, there was a need uh, and the market was willing to pay for it uh, overall. And, uh, and so he scaled up that way. And I just, you know, that's a, it's anecdotal. Um, but I think that uh, there's so many different cool things that, uh, that you can do. You just, there is about taking a leap, doing that very first thing, uh, stepping over the edge. And I tell people all the time that the best thing I've learned from Claudine is I just demystified the starting your own business thing. Hmm. It is, uh, it's, you take your, some common sense, you take some intuition, you know, there was a business model thought, you know, behind it a little bit, but, but we just did it. And, uh, and you will figure things out just like in the military where you're given impossible problems uh, with limited resources and, uh, and smart people figure stuff out. Um, and, you know, that's, I think I've learned more, more from the military about running a business than anything I learned in business school. So mm, That's great. That's great. Um, I'm just trying to, I know we're, we're starting to run short on time. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you, you had mentioned legality and I, I was curious about that. Like, how do you kind of deal with shipping to states that don't allow wine. And I was also wondering if, you, if you've tried getting wines, maybe it's not the, the target market, but into the NEX or uh, the AAFES, yep. which uh, Steve wrote, and I'm assuming that is like the Air Force equivalent of the NEX. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> AP is, that's the, yeah, it's, that's exactly right. Army and Air Force exchange, yep. Okay, yep. Yeah, so, um, so that was a, a decision early on about what license we got. So different licenses allow you to do different things. Uh, and I actually went to the uh, liquor control in California, said, hey, this is kind of our business model. And I let them kind of guide me to the type of license I needed so that I could uh, ship and, and, that, and that sort of thing. So uh, it is challenging. There are some states we can't get into. Utah, um, Alabama, I have to ship to an ABC store uh, and then you customers would have to come pick that up. So I don't do that. Um, a couple other states that are really challenging. Um, but otherwise, uh, if you if, if you're licensed to, to go to those, uh, um, and there's software out there that'll help you do this, by the mm. way. So it's not something that I've got to, you know, meticulously, uh, you know, keep track of. Um, some software helped me with that. Um, but it's, uh, it's challenging. Uh, to your other point about being in, in atheists or next, um, so we so the, the 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 license that we have does not allow us to wholesale. So we cannot sell to a distributor, and the mm. distributor sells then to the retailer. So we have chosen specifically to go direct to consumer. So that's the only way that we can sell. So um, we've been in a couple of restaurants in California, which allows that restaurant the the, the laws are such that the restaurant can buy directly from us. But in most states, you have what have the three tier system. So you got a retailer, you got a wholesaler, uh, and then you, you got a producer. Uh, and you can't, uh, you have to go through all three of those. Uh, so if you want to be in a in a, a retail outlet, so um, that has not made sense for us. We don't have the scale to do that. Uh, that is a place we could go in the future. Um, but right now, if I had to do that uh, right now, our margins aren't such that the, that we could support doing a wholesale uh, model. And if, if someone is not in Utah or not in Alabama and yeah. interested in, in trying out Claudine, uh, what's, what's your website or what's the best way for them to get a hold of that? Absolutely. So www.claudinewines, C-L-A-U-D-I-N-E, wines.com. Uh, and then you can see what we've got. So we do small projects. So things turn over pretty fast. If you see it there, that means we've got it. Um, and then, uh, you know, two or three months, something's usually on the website and then you were looking for the next project. So, um, so it's, uh, it's, it's this, it's not, you're not going to get a consistent thing every year. We're not going to have from the same vineyard, the same stuff year over year. Uh, we just look for what's best out there and generally have calves and pinots. Uh, and we just did a Chardonnay for the first time. Um, but that's uh, that's the best way to do it. You know, if we do a first order discount, 50 bucks off, um, you know, and I'm happy to, I'll do a, a special link for the, uh, the oh, uniform list. 
so that uh, so they get a little maybe a little better bump uh, for for that. But we try to de-risk it uh, again. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna take a chance and you're gonna send me you know some money. I want to make sure that, uh, that that you have a good experience. Uh, and so the one way I do that is to to make the first uh, first order pretty uh, pretty inexpensive, and you get to try um, try you know maybe our whole lineup. So that's great. Well, I always like to leave the last question open-ended. You can take that either as what have we not covered that you want to make sure listeners know or any final words of wisdom you want to leave them with. Yeah, so I won't, uh, words of wisdom, it means that I have wisdom to give. I, you know, I just tell people to just go and do it. You know, uh, the preparation happens, you know, you read, read books or listen to podcasts and uh, that's all really good training or you've been in the military. That is the best training for, for running a business because you're just a, a problem solver. Uh, so just do it. Just get out there and do it. If you need help getting over that edge, call me, email me and uh, we'll, we'll talk through it. Um, but I've had, I've had great conversations with so many people who just gave up their time, uh, who helped me refine my business model. Sometimes, and I've talked to people too, who just didn't have a great business model that like, Hey, you're trying to buy something essentially for $5 and sell it for $5. That's not, there's no business there. Mm. Uh, and so I'll give you, you know, straight, uh, you know, straight talk about that. Mm. Um, but yeah, just, just do it. It would be the words of encouragement just to get over the hump and do it and do it while you're in uniform. I mean, talk about de-risking things. If you can do it on the side uh, while you still have that extra income. Wow. I mean, that's definitely uh, the best way to go. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Brian, for your time. And for listeners in the show notes, I'll have a link to Clouding Wines in case you didn't jot that down. And uh, yeah, really appreciate your advice and your willingness to uh, extend the discount, but also to, to help out people who give you a call. And I, th I think it's a powerful example of how, yeah, again, that generosity, it, it does good in the world. So I, I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Again, thanks for your time. Uh, I love listening to, uh, to your podcast and uh, super cool to, to be able to be on it. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Quick couple admin points. Um, we release brand new episodes every single Monday and Thursday. Those are usually recorded uh, about a month or so before they go live. Um, and um, every Monday and Thursday, we have an interview, usually almost always with a military veteran about their civilian career. More and more, we're starting to add in experts who may not be met veterans, but may have some expertise that will help the military veteran community. Um, Saturdays, I typically post more of a behind the scenes episode, which is a free form format. I try to use what I'm calling a mullet format. And by that, I mean business up front, party in the back, uh, talking through admin points, uh, professional topics related to the podcast. It might be a conversation I had that week. It might have been an interview I had that week, but just trying to, to share things that are top of mind that may help you in more of a free form, straight from the heart format. And then the party in the back is the personal side of things, just kind of more free flowing uh, thoughts on life, on um, uh, improving oneself, just kind of whatever's going on in life and trying to be authentic and um, honest about um, those things as well. Special thanks. We have an all volunteer here army of people behind Beyond the Uniform making this possible. Uh, we do this on our lunch breaks, on our evenings, on our weekends, because we love the military community. We want to give back. We want to make a difference. We want that as part of the purpose in our life that we we valued in the military. Um, so special thanks to Steve Bain. Steve does pretty much everything. He helps uh, secure guests. He does our newsletter. He keeps the reels rolling and keeps me sane. Kathleen Dillon, the first person to join our team. She writes text transcripts of every single episode. It's wild. She keeps up with two of these a week despite a demanding career and education right now. Uh, but those transcripts help us get more SEO value, helps her audience more. Um, Andrew Woolridge is our data guru. He helps us understand the numbers, which is the easiest way for us to figure out how we can better support you and um, adds kind of the, the data oversight for that. Rick Healy does all of our social media. He is gaining more and more of an audience for us by getting our videos, getting our podcasts out on social channels. Um, the best way to stay in contact with us is if you go to beyondtheuniform.org, there is a newsletter. You'll have a little pop-up that comes up. You can put your email in. We email twice per month. We try to be respectful, but it is a great way to get uh, appraised of upcoming events, 
upcoming interviews, promos where companies are giving discounts to Beyond the Uniform listeners, and more. Uh, this does cost money to put on. We are um, con- uh, committed to not charging veterans directly. Um, and the way that we kind of offset costs is through corporate sponsors. So if you know of a company that would like to get in front of a military audience and their families, uh, that's one way that we can both add value to our members, but also offset the costs of Beyond the Uniform and give us a little bit of budget to start expanding what we're doing. So that's the, the best way you can help us. If that's not something that you can do, a positive review on iTunes is greatly appreciated. Have a wonderful week. We will be back Monday, Thursday, and Saturday with more interviews. And uh, yeah, keep up the, the, the listening. Take care.